So today's message is James 5, 19 to 20, and I'm calling it the Ministry of Restoration. What is that term restoration in the Bible? Well, have you ever gotten something restored before? Sometimes people get uh, electronics or phones or laptops. They take it to a tech company uh, so they can restore it back to, you know, as close as possible to its original condition. In my life, restoring kids' toys is a daily, <laughs> daily blessing. I'm pretty good at, you know, getting the little screwdriver out and replacing the batteries and getting the duct tape out or the super glue and, and you know, just telling the kids it's totally restored. <laughs> and they believe me, it's great. Uh, mechanics, they love to restore old cars. Uh, they love to put time in and skill and effort to make those old cars run again like new and be all polished up and shiny and, and restore their value, even increase their value. And you know what? I recently had my uh, old Bible restored. Uh, it was falling apart, held together by duct tape, and now it's been fully re-put together. And I, I love that. You know, the Bible shows us that people can also be restored by God. Restoration means when someone's life gets off track or they fall into a sinful situation or a mess, God loves to show mercy and does a work in our lives to bring us back to a relationship with him and he restores not only uh, the connection with heaven but he even starts restoring our life again uh, physically and, and relationally, and he gives us a fresh start. God is the expert at restoration. You know, he's not looking for an excuse to punish us, to slam us, to avenge us. God is not eager to shoot lightning on someone when they uh, rebel. Actually, God's heart is to restore us back to a right relationship, first with him, and then even with other believers. And today we'll talk about how God is a God of restoration. He shows grace and mercy and he looks to restore and rebuild our lives with blessings we do not deserve. And, and also we'll talk in James here how when God seeks to restore a person, he will often use someone who's been restored themselves as his tool to reach another person. It's like a great mechanic who has his toolkit ready to go. You know, God, his toolkit is, is us. We are his instruments. And it gives him great glory when he uses us to help someone be restored. Think of a mechanic who can restore an old car using just, you know, the basic tools. And we might think, how can God ever use me? Well, if a mechanic does that and you see, well, you used those tools and made that, it gives the mechanic great glory. And it gives great glory to God when he uses us in the ministry of restoration. Look at verse 19 and 20. Brethren, or brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. First observation is the heart of James to encourage us never to give up on people. James himself wrote the letter of James to restore early Christians back from a dead faith to an active, living faith. See, many in James's day were discouraged by trials. They were giving in to temptations. They were loose with their tongues. They were hurting each other. They were not living out their faith. Some were discouraged by the mega wealthy who were oppressing them. And James wrote how he wants, God wants us to be having a faith that is alive, that is active. So James now says, if you have an active faith, the fruit of that will be that you are having a heart and on the lookout to help others. Come back to God. God wants to use you, says James. In a way, James is looking here at the end of the letter to reproduce himself and say, now you guys go out, and as I've written to you, now you go and draw others back to Jesus with the work of the Holy Spirit. 
partner with God and go and restore others. It's similar to what Mark was saying. Go, therefore, and make disciples, the great commission from Jesus. James is kind of ending the letter with that thrust. You've been restored now. Go restore others. Look at the concern James brings up. He says, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. Notice it says brethren or brothers and sisters, and then among you, the second group there, someone from among you wanders away from the truth. So it's talking about when we've known someone who has been a part of the family of God or been connected at church, and then they wander away. The word wander there means to be deceived and led astray. It has the idea of someone who's roaming about without a fixed foundation. They may have the truth in front of them, but they leave it to go check out other things that turn them away from God. And the Greek word wander here in the original is the same kind of word we get the word planet from in our language. In the ancient world, they called planets heavenly wanderers. And they were saying that in how they behave differently than the stars. See, stars are in a fixed position compared to each other. And you can rely on them and use them for navigation. But then when planets at certain times of the year come into view, they, they, they're disconnected from the starscape and they seem to be wandering. So the word wander comes from that word, like planet. So the person who wanders from the truth is someone who has at some point seen or heard of Jesus, the gospel message, the good news of salvation, that Jesus came, he died on the cross, and he rose again to save us from our sins. Somehow it's been a part of their, their journey, but they have not stuck with it. They have not been found their foundation in the gospel. Maybe they accepted it. Maybe they just heard it and somewhat received it a little bit. Maybe it's mentally like, oh yeah, I, I, I believe that, but, I'm, but it never went down deep enough to become their life. Or maybe it did and they've, they've been deceived and turned away. That's what James is talking about. And there could be a variety of reasons why at some point people turn away from the Lord. Friends, let me remind you this morning, there is a spiritual battle going on for your life and for my life. There are three enemies that always try to pry us away from God. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan, he's very real. He's always looking to seduce us and deceive us. And if he can't do that, at least discourage us and distract us. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And on top of the spiritual battle, in addition, we are constantly pulled down by the world system around us. The popular moral codes of our society that says, just go with the flow, and it mocks a person who tries to follow Jesus. And the third, the worst enemy of all, is actually our own sinful desires that are within us, the flesh, the fallen nature that is drawn to sin. You guys, the Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. There's a battle going on for all of us. And it's a bit like the forces of gravity trying to pull us down. If we are not actively pushing forward toward the Lord, this can happen to any of us. Now, Jesus taught a parable and he described how this can happen in a variety of reasons. It's the parable of the soils. Matthew 13. It talks about how a sower went out and he sowed and scattered seed. And the seed is the Bible, it's the word of God, it's the gospel message. And the ground is like people. And he said there were four types of ground. First of all was the hard ground. And in my garden at home, I've, I've trodden in paths, and there's hardly even any weeds that grow on those because they've been trodden, it's been compacted so much. And if a seed falls on that, it's, it's not going to work. Actually, a bird, Jesus said, comes and just takes it away. And it's like when you share the gospel with someone or someone's been in a church and, and they just forget about 
Jesus. Is it that Satan takes away uh, that that heart, that desire for God altogether, and they just do yeah, whatever. And they have a hard heart, Jesus said. Now there's another group, and it's called the shallow ground, where the seed went into the dirt, but it wasn't rich and deep. It had no depth for roots, and quickly shoots sprang up, but they had no deep roots, and as soon as it gets hot and sunny, the plants shrivel and die. And that's like a person who has an initial reaction, response to God. They're open to spiritual things, but it doesn't last. Their faith doesn't go deep. They don't continue reading God's word, and when the heat is turned up, trials come, persecutions come, oh, they quickly fade away. Another group, Jesus said, is like when the seed falls among the thick thorns and weeds. The seeds will produce a small little plant, but the weeds grow up stronger and choke out that plant, and it never produces any fruit. Jesus said there are some people like that, and they, they may, you may know them, they, and maybe you've been that person at times, where we respond to Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I want to know Jesus. But Jesus said, the cares of this world... And the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word, and they become unfruitful. You can tell that person because, oh, they say they're a Christian, and they may have responded to Jesus, but there's really no fruit in their life. And we have to be careful. I myself have to be careful. It's so easy to get so busy with the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of things, materialism. No, we actually need to intentionally make Jesus number one every week, every day. And when we don't, our faith can fizzle and be crowded out by all these pursuits and distractions. Then Jesus said there's the fourth kind of soil, and that's the good soil. And it represents the person whose faith is proven genuine and lasting because there's fruit. Jesus said, he who receives seed on the good ground is the one who hears the word of God and understands it meaning the heart. It's not just up here. It takes that 18-inch drop as they pursue God. And Jesus said they indeed bear fruit. And some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. You know, people are going to have different uh, expressions of their faith and amount of fruit that we see. But when there's fruit there, we know that their heart is good soil. Some people have a hard heart toward God. Some have a shallow heart. Some have a crowded heart. And the prayer we need to pray, even today, as we read that first line about people who wander from the truth, is, Lord, help me to be the good soil. Help me to take the gospel to heart, to live for you. Let the roots of my faith go deep, and let me not be distracted in my pursuit of you. Guys, let's be clear. Some will, for various reasons, wander away from the truth. An example in the New Testament is a gentleman by the name of Demas. Paul wrote about him three different times. And you see, as Paul writes, he's fading away. And by the end, Paul writes to Timothy. And he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. And Paul was saying, I'm sad because Demas has gradually chosen the things of this world instead of joining me in, in the mission. And he's departed. And like Demas, people can often adjust their belief system to accommodate their own lifestyle. I can think of two common ways that people who know about God turn away. Liberalism and legalism. Now, liberalism is when we take verses of the Bible out. And, and I, I'm not really sure if that was actually what Jesus said. And I don't know if we can really take Paul literally and... I don't know. And people take away from the Bible to accommodate their lifestyle. That's religious liberalism. The opposite extreme is also true. Legalism. That's when we're adding to the Word of God. And we're adding extra rules, adding extra boundaries, extra principles that we now hold up even level or above the Bible. And eventually those people will turn away from the Lord because they can't live up to legalism. It just pushes people away. You guys, we have the blessing of simply enjoying the Lord, his word. As James said, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. 
God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. We have the blessing of a real relationship. Jesus is the truth. When it says they wander from the truth, it means they wander from Jesus. And the truth, Jesus said, is my word. And, and when you remain in my word, you'll be my disciples. And the truth will set you free. Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, we must give more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. There is a battle going on right now for your life because you are so precious to God. Don't go into neutral. Keep praying. Keep reading the word. Let church be a non-negotiable in your life, a priority. Otherwise, we could all drift from the truth. So, you guys, there are three different types of people who I'm talking to right now. There's the person who's never really had a relationship with God. And today, if that is you, you can have that by truly receiving the gospel, by saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And you look to Jesus. There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Not your works. You can't be saved by your performance. But Jesus died on the cross. It's his work. He rose again. Put your trust in his work, not your own. And you're born again. You're saved. You're redeemed. You're forgiven. And you may have heard that a million times, but let it be really received, where he is not just saving us from hell, but he's becoming the Lord of our life. That's what it means to be born again. So I'm also talking to the person who has had that, but has fallen away. Maybe you've even been in a healthy church and something has happened that caused you to turn away. You know, today is the day of restoration. To become right with God, you need to repent and confess your sin. And as you do that, God fully restores you and brings you back. I'm thinking, of course, of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, it says he finally arose and came back to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to all his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put sandals on his feet. You're restored to the family. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. This is my son. He was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they were all happy. They were all merry, it says. So that's the heart of God. He wants to restore anyone who's gone far. And no matter what depths you've been in of sin, come back to God and receive that restoration, the love of the Father. And the third group I'm talking to today is actually the person who is clearly a Christian. You're standing strong in your beliefs. You're maybe consistently attending church, maybe even serving in a church, but slowly in your heart there's a backsliding away from Jesus being the first love. Revelation 2 verse 7, Jesus wrote a letter to the church of Ephesus. And he said, I know your works. But nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So yeah, even us who are well-connected and serving, sometimes we are, are falling away from the truth, and we need to repent and come back. And the truth is not just the doctrine, it's the heart. It's to say, I want to love Jesus first and lord help me to do that and he will he will call out to him repent and go back to that first love so james back to james here verse 19 he's encouraging us to be on the lookout not only for our own spiritual well-being like i've just talked about but actually for others spiritual well-being as well look at verse 19 if someone turns him back, and verse 20, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So I want to talk for a few moments about uh, what this means. 
And then we're going to apply it with six points, practically, how we can be a part of the ministry of the restoration. And if you've got uh, a pen or uh, a note app or something, I'm going to give Bible references. We're going to look in depth at how we can restore others. But notice first here, it's talking about the great reward that comes, that we can actually be a part of this. You see, restoration is not just about getting someone back into a pew or back to a church. It's actually about them coming back to know the Lord. It's about their relationship with God. And that word turn back there literally means to turn around. True repentance is needed first, and then great restoration comes. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it. But Jesus then said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So when someone comes back to Jesus, he is saving them literally from the path of destruction. This is really serious. And if that's where you're at today, turn from the error of your way. How? Call out to Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. and He will save you as you call out to him. James says a couple more little details here. He says, we will be able to save a soul from death. What does that mean? Well, there's two possible interpretations. One is speaking of spiritual death, that someone is separated from God by sin and we can help them come alive to God and be saved. I think that's true. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God in his mercy makes us alive together in Christ Jesus. So it could be talking about them going to heaven. But I also see in here the possibility that what James is saying is that some sins actually lead to physical death in this life. And if we can help someone come back to God, we can prevent them from sinning more and more and harming themselves to the point where they may even die because of sin. So this is a really important thing. I want to help someone who's going down a path of destruction to be saved, both in this life and in the one to come. Lord, help me. And then it says at the end of verse 20, we will get to cover a multitude of sins. I love that phrase, multitude of sins. It doesn't matter how bad a person's sins are or how many they've committed, God grants forgiveness even to a multitude of sins. And what a joy it is when someone turns back to God and they've been transformed from the inside out and they're receiving true freedom. I just love that. And sometimes that happens over a course of weeks or months. Sometimes it happens very quickly. Maybe sometimes it even happens up here after the service or when we visit. And maybe you've had the chance to pray with someone to be restored and you can see the Holy Spirit's grace and favor. You can see the weight of sin and guilt and shame being released. You can see a true life change that starts there from the inside out. You know, it's a lie. Sometimes we think, I've got to clean myself up first and then come to God. No, come and bring as, all, as you are all, your, all that sin. <clears throat> That's all you can offer to God, actually, is your need and your sin. And he will clean you up. Don't try and clean yourself up. It won't work. Come to God as you are. Now, when it says there, we cover a multitude of sins. Let's be clear. It's not our part as people to forgive someone in heaven or to atone for their sin. That's God's role. And that's why Jesus died on the cross and rose again. So we do not atone for sin, but we do get on board with how God has forgiven sin on the cross. And we say, you're forgiven as they repent. And we also get on board by forgiving those who have hurt us. That's not easy, but actually when you realize how much you've been forgiven, that you deserve hell, and you say, Lord, help me to forgive those who've hurt me, real forgiveness comes. It's called releasing the debt that they owe you. 
release it to God in prayer. Lord, I know they've hurt me so much, I just let it go to you. Release that debt. And it also means that we do not shame people for their past when they turn to Jesus. We partner with God. We forgive them. And in so doing, it's just a, a wonderful event. And, and it's actually a normal event in a, in a spirit-filled church that's, that sinners are coming and repenting and being restored and being accepted. That should be the norm. That's what we pray for. It's, it's an everyday miraculous function of a, a healthy ministry in church and a healthy Christian. And you know what? We forgive, we accept back, and you know what? We just all move together forward by grace. And we don't have to shame that person for what they did in the past. Now, we, we're looking for true repentance, but then it's like it's gone. It's forgiven. Amen? You guys, if Christians are willing to forgive and to cover the shame of past sin, a church can really be a grace-filled hospital, a spiritual hospital where any sinner has every opportunity to start afresh in life and be accepted and supported and discipled when they come back to the Lord. If you agree, you can say amen. amen. <laughs> because you know what? I love it when, uh, when I hear the odd amen every now and again. And when I read this again this morning, I was amening. I don't know how that got in my sermon, but well, I meant to that. Actually, a uh, little story. We have. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll introduce next week to you a new pastor who has joined Calvary Chapel in Winnipeg in the last few weeks. And he is, his name's Bob. I'm going to put him up on the screen. He's a black man uh, from Liberia, and his whole church are, is a black church. And they've decided it's time to get verse by verse through the scripture and join Calvary Chapel. And uh, you can watch them online. I'll, I'll give you the link if you want it. And they are like, amen, in every other sentence. It's just awesome. <laughs> amen? Amen. That's just great. I mean, we can learn from those brothers and sisters, right? Uh, how do we restore someone to Christ? I'm going to talk about now six ways that we see through the Bible how we can partner with God and restore someone. And each one will have a verse. Be ready to jot them down. I'll read what I can, and, and we'll turn to Galatians in a minute. The first one, point number one, how to restore someone, is ask God for a real heart to see restoration in those who are lost or fallen. Do you have a strong heart to see sinners restored? It starts with the heart. Jesus even called us to love our enemies. Be willing to extend grace and forgiveness. Be willing to bear one another's burdens. Do you know many of the people God used in the New Testament made big mistakes and sins in their lives along the way? Who's the one who wrote, you know, most of the New Testament? Well, it's either Luke or Paul, depending on who wrote Hebrews. But Paul, think of his life. I mean, he was known, he was Saul of Tarsus. You read the story in Acts chapter 8 persecuting the church, murdering Christians. And God extended to him so much grace and forgiveness of all his sin that he became the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. Paul the apostle, and he wrote so much of the New Testament. You guys, the church is not to be a museum of spiritual saints. It's to be a hospital for the sick where we all receive great forgiveness and mercy. Amen. <laughs> oh, I love it. Another guy is John Mark. Do you know him? Sometimes just called Mark in the Bible. Not this Mark. <laughs> and he made a big mistake in Acts chapter 13. We don't know what it was, but it was bad enough to offend Paul. So much, Paul refused to bring him on the second missionary journey. And he parted ways even with Uncle Barnabas, Mark's uncle, who had actually helped restore Paul. And Paul ended up parting ways because... He couldn't forgive Mark, couldn't accept him. But later on, Paul grew in grace and extended full restoration even to Mark. And Paul wrote to Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry. <laughs> so there was great restoration as, as God grew Paul in grace. And God restored Mark and Mark even later on wrote the gospel of Mark. Even though he made a major mistake, God used him to write the gospel. Isn't that awesome? 
Another example, of course, is Peter. I will never deny you. They might, but I won't. <laughs> Remember that story? How did that go, Peter? We know he denied Jesus three times. And there was a crowing of that rooster. And after the resurrection, Jesus sought out Peter with his heart of restoration. John chapter 21, if you want to read it. It says Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? See, three times he denied. Now three times Jesus restores him. And he says, Peter, it's not about your performance. It's about your heart. It's about your love. Do you love me? And he received the grace and forgiveness of God. And Peter went on to be one of the most powerful men ever used by the Lord. Read Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4. I mean, you just read Acts chapter 10. God used Peter so much. Becoming a person of restoration begins with having a heart for the lost. Does your heart carry a burden for those who have fallen, like the Lord's burden? You know, restored people restore people. It's that simple. Ask God to give you a heart for those who are lost. And if you don't have it, ask God to show you how much he's given to you. Secondly, first have a heart for restoration. Secondly, pray for those who've gone astray. Now what verse is that? Well, look back at verse 16 in James. At the very end there, it says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We learned from Elijah in 17 and 18 last week. When we pray with the heart, in line with God's word, in line with God's will, like Elijah did about the rain, those kind of prayers avail much. Do you have an active prayer life? And, and see how James goes from prayer to restoration, just like that. I think there's a, a link, a connection in the context of James. He's saying, if you want to have that ministry of restoration, be a person of prayer. And pray for those who have fallen. You know, we can pray not based on our righteousness, but on the gift of God's righteousness in us. We taught that last week. Run boldly to the throne of grace. Every day, pray, because God has made you righteous, and he's listening. By the way, another reason, and this is kind of helpful it, mentally for me, when I, when I burden for someone and they're not and I prayed, and they're not coming back, and I prayed for them, and they're not coming back. Only God can change a heart. That's actually really helpful for us to, to remember that. Because we can be tempted to think, well, I'm not doing enough to convince them or to lay out logical arguments for them or to you know, draw them somehow. You know, it's only the Father who draws people. It's the Holy Spirit's work in their life that we're praying for. And that means we can keep praying even when we don't see any fruit and we can believe that God is listening to our prayers. And we can't argue someone and we can't convince them, but God can change even the hardest of hearts. Listen to 1 John 5. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us whatever we ask. And we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for him. See, John went on from the next verse after that in 1 John 5. He said, ask according to God's will, you'll have it. And then he said, there are some who've gone out from among us. Pray for them. So just like James, prayer and restoration go together. So number one, have a heart for restoration. Number two, pray. Number three, ask God to use you in the ministry of restoration. Proverbs 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. See, God actually wants to use you. And you can pray, not just God save them and restore them, but God, use me in this ministry. Even this week, help me to plant seeds. Help me to water seeds. Help me to minister to people about the grace and the love of God. Daniel, chapter 12, verse 3 Speaking of great rewards that come when we go to heaven, it says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. 
See, it's not about our ability to influence others. It's just about our availability. When we go to heaven, that's what we'll see. We'll see all those who've come back to the Lord because we prayed. We'll see those who've returned to Jesus because we witnessed to them. And we will see it and we will be shining like the stars, says Daniel, forever and ever. That's the thing we'll be rejoicing about. So let's pray. God, use me. Use my prayers. Use my witness. Use my uh, sharing. Use my social media if, if you have an opportunity. Use, use my relationship with people to draw them back to Jesus. By the way, the Lord is the good shepherd who goes after the lost sheep. Remember Matthew 18? If a man has a hundred sheep and one goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek that one that's lost? Jesus pursues people in invisible ways that we physically can't, but Jesus is working. And God can change the hardest of hearts. God can open the hardest of hearts when we least expect it. So pray, Lord, restore people, and if possible, use me this week. Isn't that awesome? Now, the first three I've just mentioned are about really the heart. Having a heart, praying, saying, God, use me. I want to talk about three more before we close that are more practical tips. How to restore someone to Jesus. Point number four is in Galatians chapter 6, if you turn there. A few pages to the left. Galatians 6. And it says, Brethren, in 6 verse 1, If a man is overtaken... In any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here's point number four, is make sure, first of all, that you are spiritually strong. If you're going to talk with someone about coming back to the Lord, you've got to make sure you are on solid ground. Before you help someone, you need to believe it. And you need to be living it. You can't help someone to have an active faith if your faith is dead. Why would anyone listen to someone who's grumpy? <laughs> to someone who's hypocritical? To someone who's not living or loving or genuinely caring? No, be a good example is what that means. He who is spiritual restores such a one. And be strong enough in your own faith that you can enter the battle spiritually over that person's life as you meet with them. You guys, if a soldier in a troop is coming out of a mission and he realizes his buddy's left behind, his buddy's been hit, you know how soldiers' mentality is, none shall be left behind. And what do they do? They go back in. What's going to happen? They're going to get shot at. And that's going to happen. Make sure... To Paul says to the Galatians, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You've got to be strong enough that you can handle the spiritual battle that's going to come when you enter the ministry of trying to help someone be restored. It also says there in verse 1, I love this, in a spirit of gentleness. When, we, when we're having the opportunity to talk to someone about the Lord, have humility don't, don't come at it like you're above them, like you're looking down on them. Make it clear that you're dealing with your own pride, with your own sins, that we're, on the, we're the same. It's only God's grace that, that's the difference, and you, you can have that today, and you can be restored. Consider yourself, it says, lest you also be tempted. See that in verse 1? <laughs> See, if you know a person is falling under a particular temptation, make sure you know before you talk with them what the Bible actually says. And you have strong convictions in your own life how you're living for the Lord. Then you can help them and bear their burden and help them out of that sin rather than getting tempted yourself and pulled down by discouragement into that sin. And then verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ." Christ. You know, an example today is we have uh, these frontline workers in our society who are uh, what we would call essential services, those who especially are in the medical field. 
for example, and there's others. But some would say that church and being in church together is not really an essential service. Hey, what I read in the Bible, what I'm seeing today, when it comes to spiritual life, eternal life, and overall well-being that comes really only from the Lord, there's nothing more essential than being together as Christians. There's nothing that compares. Spiritually, this is the most essential part of our life, is our believing family. You know, when a boat is going in danger in a storm, the boat needs a lighthouse to save them from hitting the rocks. That's the church. We are to be a lighthouse in this city, to stand strong in our faith. And when an individual is cast out of the boat and they're drowning, they need a lifesaver. They need a lifeguard. They need someone to jump in and save them. That's the individual Christian. That's your ministry of restoration and how hard it is for someone who doesn't know how to swim to survive. And so too, it's, it's our responsibility as believers, according to James and Paul here, Lord, use me. Help me to be spiritual so I can restore someone else. If you focus on your own walk with the Lord, you'll have the power to help someone else. See, a lifeguard has to be strong enough to save the person. A lifeguard must be good swimmer, must be a strong person, must know the techniques. See, a person who's drowning is going to panic, is going to kick, is going to flail. And a lifeguard needs to be, in this case, spiritual. You need to be ready to restore that one. It's not going to be easy. We need to be the church, and we need to care for one another. And when someone starts to go down, what do we do? Make sure you're spiritual, make sure you're prayed up, make sure you're ready for the battle, and go and minister to them and try your best to rescue them. So that leads us to point number five today. Reach out. Reach out to someone. When God has put them in your life and, and you're praying for them and God starts nudging you, it's time for you to talk to them. It's time for you to call them. It's time for you to message them because they need to come back to me and I'm going to use you to share the truth. When you pray it up like that, you can reach out in confidence because you're hearing the Lord give you that nudge, give you that confidence. Now's the time. You know what? First of all, we must be doing this constantly with each other, encouraging each other, exhorting one another. Hebrews 10, don't forsake fellowship, but exhort one another consistently as we see the day approaching. But also when someone individually is, is, is fallen. You know, we are to initiate Love initiates. It doesn't wait, you know, prove yourself. What's my verse for that? Well, Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we're sinners, Christ died for us. Love initiates. Now, we must be led by the Spirit in prayer. How we reach out, how we love those who have fallen. And you know, our job is not to judge their motive or their heart. We see sin for what it is. We know what the Bible says. God has already judged a certain lifestyle that they're falling into. We're not going to judge them. We're going to share with them God, what God has already said, and here's the hope. Turn to Christ and repent. Now, what if they reject me, Pastor? <laughs> what if this gets worse and they push me away? Well, you know what? Don't take that personal. Keep praying for them. They need the Lord. It's not you that are Rejecting, it's the word of God if you've shared it with grace, with gentleness, with humility, and with truth. And you know what? Be patient because they may end up coming back later on and saying, okay, what you shared with me, I've been thinking about it. And that is the truth. And now the last point today, point number six. We must, as we reach out, take a stand for truth. Take a very clear stand for truth. Ephesians 4, verse 15 says, Speak the truth in love. Oh, we're loving, but we're speaking the truth. We're not hiding it. You know, a good doctor, 
when he reads a scam and he sees a concern, he doesn't hide it. He speaks the truth in order for restoration, for healing. You know, this is what I see. We need to put you on these medications, this treatment. You need to change this in your lifestyle. And, you know, we, the Lord is like the doctor who, who identifies sin in our life. We don't judge people. But we're like the nurse after the fact who then says, okay, here's the medication. Here's the lifestyle that, that you need. We deliver that care to people. We, have, we bear their burdens. The Lord's already spoken the truth. Now we can just deliver it. And we can help someone be restored. This is so important. I found an article. I don't even know who wrote it. It was in my file from a Calvary chapel out of the U.S. And they wrote about this verse and how to talk to someone when you're confronting sin and you're trying to restore them. And this is what they said. When a mature Christian seeks a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person who has wandered away, it's done in love and humility with the sole purpose of bringing that brother or sister back from sin. I like that. We're not joining with them in their lifestyle or in their party or, or in their uh, lowering ourselves to their level to try and win them by friendship. We are there to restore them and share the truth. And then he said this. Here's an example. Brother, I'm worried about you. I see sin in your life. It's going to destroy you. Jesus can and will forgive, but you need to turn away from it and turn to Jesus. doesn't get more clear than that, does it? I don't know, maybe when you hear those words, you think, what? How could I ever say that to someone, you know, face-to-face -face across a coffee table? And, and I know that's written by an American, and we're Canadian, <laughs> right? The Americans are way more natural, generally speaking, at just confronting things, being blunt. And Canadians, we're a little more subtle, a little more sensitive, a little more, ooh, don't want to, ooh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> just an example of the difference between American and Canadian, you know, even expression of worship. I don't know if you saw this week the worship service that took place in a Walmart. I think it was in Virginia or no, Pennsylvania. Did you guys see that? So here's the situation. Uh, in the U.S., the coronavirus is way more politicized even than it is here. And there are a few liberal states and counties that are completely shutting down churches while allowing casinos, bars, pot shops, etc., to be just open and with hardly any restriction. And so you, you, maybe you've seen it. Christians are saying, look, this is a double standard that's going on. And, and by the way, it might happen up here in Canada in the future, more and more. But Christians down there, they're like, well, if they're going to literally shut off the services to the church building, uh, maybe threaten the pastor with prison, that may actually happen this weekend. There's a couple of prominent pastors who I love. And if they're going to lock the doors and put chains on the churches in the name of this coronavirus, when we can social distance like everyone does at Walmart, then we're just going to go to Walmart and have church. And this actually happened. And there's a video I posted on my Facebook. You can find it there or just search it up. And uh, it's awesome. There's this whole bunch of Christians, and, you know, they're all black people from a black church. And I love watching and joining in with black worship because they're just so, oh, they can really sing. <laughs> and it sounds like a choir, and there's about 30 of them. They're right in the middle of the vegetable aisle and the clothing aisle. And they're just going for it. And it's awesome. I, I would do an impression, but I would butcher it. <laughs> and they're boldly proclaiming Jesus, and I love it. That's just an American, you know, mentality. There's, there's a lot more boldness down there, generally speaking. Can you imagine <laughs> if a group of Canadian Christians tried to do that in Walmart? I hope we do, <laughs> but it could, 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 could go pretty bad. <laughs> They'll be hiding in the back corner over by the pet supplies, you know. You are stronger, you are stronger. Oh, someone's coming! <laughs> I don't know. It's just the difference that I can see. But, uh, you know, that, that's, that phrase I read there, that, that letter, how to, how to confront someone, it might sound a little bit more, like, bold than we are normally. 
Brother, I'm worried about you. I see sin in your life. It's going to destroy you. Jesus can forgive you and will forgive you. You need to turn from it. But you know what? Oh, let's just be bold. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about destruction, possibly death in someone's life. Let's not hold back with grace, with love, with humility. Let's be those and prayerfully led, not going out there trying to convince by our arguments. But Lord, I pray for this person. I've got a heart to see them restored. Use me. And when the Lord opens a door with grace and with love and with patience, trusting God's going to change their heart, not me. And actually, here's what you can pray when you sit down with a person. Lord, just silently in your heart, what are you already doing in their heart? Help me just get on board with that today. It might just be one more step. I'm not going to force them across the line, drag them to Jesus. But Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak the truth. I'm going to speak it in love. I'm going to lay out the difference between life and death, the way of destruction, the way of salvation. Be that good healthcare worker in the, in the spiritual, essential service of the body of Christ and bring people back to the Lord. Start with the heart. Pray for those who've wandered. Ask God to use you. Make sure you're spiritually strong. Reach out as the Holy Spirit leads and stand for the truth. God will do the rest. And in conclusion, when someone does come back to the Lord, when God does that work in their heart, be ready to accept them, to love them, to rejoice with them, to share that forgiveness of Jesus with them. Jesus said there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, Father, thank you so much for James. Lord, we've loved this book. It's really risen the bar for us and challenged us to have an act of faith. And part of that is the ministry of your grace. So, Lord, give us faith to walk this out. And, Lord, help us to be strong and bold in our day, not hiding our faith, not hiding the truth, but delivering, Lord, your life-saving message. Yes, there's the bad news of sin, and we need to hear that in our day. And we then get to deliver the good news of Jesus. So Lord, help us to be walking this out, to be strong, to be spiritual, to be ready for the battle, to be prayed up, to be in the word, to be that good soil so that, Lord, you can lead us by your spirit as we reach out to those who are lost. We pray this in Jesus' name.